Hey, welcome to online, whether you're joining us uh, as a regular or whether you have just uh, stumbled upon us, it's so good to have you with us. You know, one of the things that uh, is important to us here at ALC is building connections with people because we believe that we exist for one another. Uh, we believe that, that, in fact, that our church is to be a community of hope for our city and beyond. And, and hope is best lived in partnership with one another. Hope is best expressed from one person to another. So it's so good to have you with us. Whatever you are going through in life, whether you are riding the crest of a wave or you are just staring up at a wave about to dump upon you, uh, know that uh, we value you, we appreciate you. And if you want prayer, you can just email to prayer at alc.org.nz and one of our team uh, will lift you up in prayer uh, through whatever circumstances you are going through. Well, this morning we are excited to be beginning a new series. We've just finished uh, a series called Essentials. If you caught it, uh, I hope you were blessed by it. I hope it encouraged and strengthened you. Uh, if you didn't, you can see it on Facebook or on YouTube. You'll be able to catch it there. Uh, but this series here uh, flows on from that in some ways. The last series was about uh, the essentials of, of faith, the essentials of life. What do we need to build our life on in order to step into the fullness of the plans that God has for us and to live out of, out of the fullness of who he's made us and called us to be? Uh, and, and this builds on that in some ways because... We talked in, in that series about how no one can follow Jesus alone. Uh, you can't follow Jesus by yourself. You've got to be part of his people. And that people is called the church, the body of Christ. And when we talk about the church, there's, there's many different pictures that come to mind for people. And, and often we just reduce church to, to this sort of a code for worship services or for a building. I'm going to church. Uh, and yet... It's so much more than that. And so over the next few weeks, we're just going to take a step back as uh, we begin this series called This Is Who We Are, This Is What We Do, to think about what does it mean to be the church and, and how should that shape the way that we live? And uh, I'm really excited about it because it's going to help us uh, move from where we are to where we want to be. It's going to help you become uh, a better version of yourself because uh, I believe that identity determines behavior. I believe that how we see ourselves shape what we do. And if we are living our lives with, with pictures or understandings uh, of, about our identity that are less than the way that God sees us, then our behavior is going to reflect that. And so this series of is about helping us reclaim uh, a true sense of identity as God's people so that it might shape and influence our behavior in keeping with the plans that God has for us. So let's get into it this morning. Well, when the Bible talks about the church, uh, there are five ways that it talks about it, five main ways. It talks about a family, it talks about a body, it talks about a bride, it talks about a temple, and it talks about a lampstand. And over this series, we're going to unpack these. Uh, we're not going to focus on the first two because I touched on those uh, in the previous series. And, and they're also pictures that, that we're familiar with, that we, we generally have an understanding that's in keeping with God's perspective on it. Uh, and, and so it's, I'm not going to focus on that. Instead, I'm going to just spend the next three weeks looking at a bride, a temple and a lampstand. And right out of the bat, I, I want to say, guys, you may well sit there and think, really? You know, a bride like... Uh, like really is, is that that doesn't describe me like you know uh, am I am I a bride uh, and, and my prayer is that by the end of this end of this message that you'll have an appreciation that uh, of what it means to be a bride that encourages and strengthens you because I think this is a very poignant and, and, and a very poetic description of how God sees us but not from a cultural perspective, but from heaven's perspective. And it's going to unlock, hopefully, some things inside of you that are going to allow you to, to rise up as part of God's um, uh, church, the bride of Christ, as well as if you're married, hopefully, to get you to start thinking about what it means to, uh, to be in a marriage and to see your wife, your bride, in a slightly different light. 
You see, I think, as I say, so much of our pictures are, are culturally based. And so I want to open up the scriptures this morning and begin to unfold what a bride is from, from God's perspective. And, and we see the very first bride in Genesis chapter 2. God's created the very first groom. Uh, you can't have a groom without a bride. Uh, and he says it's not good for the man to be alone. He's been a bachelor. It didn't work out for him. As many women know, being bachelors, it just doesn't work out. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, and so God says, I will make a helper just right for him. This is the first place we, we see a bride being fashioned by God right at the beginning. And I think it's so good to go back to the beginnings because when we go back to the beginning, we recalibrate ourselves and, and we regain an understanding of, of who we are and, and how we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live. Because over the time, it's so easy just a, a little bit here and a little bit there to drift off course. Uh, and so if we want to understand what it means to be a bride, we come back to here and here it is. A bride is a helper just right for the groom. A helper just right for the groom. Or as some versions have it, a, a helpmate. Or some early translations, a helpmate. Now, you may think, mm, yeah, okay. But before you read back into that from a cultural perspective uh, of, of bride, you need to understand this word helper is a little Hebrew word, meaning uh, it's a Hebrew word azor, and it simply means to help, as in to, to, to help. It also means to uh, strength. And it also means power. And if you want to know what that looks like in terms of from God's perspective, because remember, this is God speaking to himself. In Psalm 121, when David is feeling overwhelmed with life and with circumstances, this is what he says. I look to the mountains. Does my strength, does my help, does my comfort come from there? No. My help, my azor comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He's saying that the help that I need, the, the strength that I need, the power that I need only comes from God. So right at the very beginning, we see in, in the first bride, the model that, that every other is patterned on. It's not just a woman who's been called and set apart, she's going to get married. She's been created to help to be strong, to give power, to give strength, uh, and all those sorts of things. You know, it's the same word in, in Deuteronomy 33, um, where we see how blessed you are, Israel. Uh, who else is like you? You know, why are they blessed? Because there are people saved by the Lord. He is your protecting shield. He is your azor, your helper and your triumphant sword. Your enemies will cringe before you and you will stomp on their backs. Why will they be able to do all this? Because of the Azor. You see, so suddenly we begin to see the bride is not just this woman who's preparing to get married. She's been created for her role. She's created for her role. And, and I want to say right there, it should begin to stir something in us. I, I hope you're beginning to even tentatively recognize, oh, uh, woman, you weren't created to simply stand alongside of some guy. You see, you were created and for a role and you've been shaped. And, and men, I hope you understand this. If you're married, the person sitting next to you is not simply your bride. She is your help, your strength, your power. Now, she already knew that, and hopefully now you'll be in to cotton on. But if we go back to Genesis, um, you know, it's not just a helper. This, this phrase, just right, it's another little thing that we could just easily gloss over uh, and just, you know, just right. I, I found the perfect bride. Now, the, the word we translate just right is, um, is a Hebrew word, neged, and it means in front of or to be facing. Uh, to you could say to be in your face, but but not negatively like we use it in our in our culture today. Like someone's in your face, it's a it's a confronting thing. It's a negative thing. This this here is to stand in front of uh, intimately. It's it's a picture of intimacy. It's a picture of adoration. It's a it's a picture of delight. It's a picture of joy. Standing face to face, uh, looking at each other and deep into one another's eyes. And and I say that because. This is God speaking to himself and he's creating a bride and it's like he's saying, I'm going to create a bride 
who will rise up and who will bless and who will uh, help and who will strengthen and who will give power to her groom. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You see, there's a time and when, when there are times when brides have to rise up and they stand in opposition, not against their groom, but against the things that are coming against their groom. And they stand in opposition against that in prayer. They stand against that in opposition and, and, and keep it out so that their groom is able to step into the plans and the purposes that God has for them and be all that God has called them to be. And so I hope suddenly you're beginning to see that this elevates marriage. This begins to change our concept of a bride. So often we go through life, um, especially here in Western culture, but I, I know in other cultures as well, where we look at our bride almost, almost like a trophy. We'd never use that term. Well, I hope you would never use that term, but it's almost like, hey, I did well. Look at her. I did well. And you put your arm around her waist and, and you, you draw her near because, you know, she, she needs protection and everything else. And you should protect your bride. You should honor and, and, and cherish them. But that's not the picture that the Bible creates. You see, your bride isn't just there to be cherished and to be nurtured and to be loved and to be protected. She's there to release the fullness of, of what God has in, into the groom's life. She's there to, as a helper, a perfect helper, to bring strength, to bring power, to, to, to be what he needs when he needs it. You know, when he has none, she has it. When he's lost, she's not. When he's weak, she's not. She completes him in ways that, that are beyond the, just the emotional and the physical that we often talk about. It's so much deeper than that. You know, I've known this to be true in my life. The success that I draw, enjoy in my life, the, the successes that I've experienced, I can attribute every, each and every one of them to my wife, Anne. It's, it, I, I'm not trying to diminish or, 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 or uh, deny the abilities and the talents that God has blessed me with and created within me. But these have only been able to find expression because she has stood as my strength, as my power, interceding and praying and, and keeping away the things of the enemy, being that, being that protecting shield that's allowed me to step into it. She hasn't been standing behind me. She's been going in front of me. She's been turning around and looking at me and reading my eyes and, and seeing the anxiety and, go, and saying, OK, I understand that. And then doing spiritual battle. And then she turns around and she sees adoration and, and, and we come close. And, and then something happens and she sees that, that look in my eye and she turns back around and she fights. She's strong. She's, she's all of those things. That's what a bride does. Guys, I think you really need, if you're married, to maybe sit back for a moment and just give thanks for the one you call your wife. She's the perfect help for you. She's not just the one who looks after you physically. She's the one who spiritually and emotionally provides what you need. As David looked to the hills and it couldn't give him what he needed, your job can't, your friends can't, only she can. Cherish her, love her, protect her, because that's what she's gonna do for you. You see, a bride is an incredible thing. And, if, and if, if the Bible begins to change our perspective of what it means to, uh, to, to have someone as a bride, if the Bible begins to challenge our preconceived ideas of what a bride is, and we also, I think, need to step back and say, well, okay, maybe we need to reframe and rethink our picture of a bride when it comes to a church. Because, as I say, identity determines behavior. And if we are living with this image of a bride that's deficient, our behavior is not going to uh, reflect the fullness of what God has called you and I to. You see, <clears throat> this is who we are. This is what we do. We are the bride of Christ. We are his help. We are his strength. We are his power. And we are just right. The Bible can say that we are just right, that we are equal to our groom because we are made in his image. Could I have this next? Genesis 1.26. God says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. It doesn't mean to say we are equal in divinity or anything like that. It means we are equal to our groom. 
we are able to be his strength, to be his power, to be his perfect help. Think about that for a moment. Think of the implications. So often we think of hierarchically, don't we? You know, there's Jesus, there's us. And yet Jesus is inviting us to step out of that and see us as his equal, a perfect helper, a, a bride who stands with the groom. Isn't that powerful? That Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, elevates us up out of who we were and stands us alongside of himself as his bride. You see, we were created to, to help and to defend and to protect our groom. And I think the truth is that even though that's who we are, it's not what we've done, is it? I think we haven't done it well. We haven't protected. We haven't upheld. Uh, we haven't defended our groom in the same way that the Bible expects of us. We are his strength. Think about that for a moment. The Bible says that when God created the first bride and we are patterned on that, that we are the groom's strength. Hebrews chapter 12, is, um, it says that Jesus was able to, uh, he endured the cross because of the joy awaiting him, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. There's no question that when it's talking about the joy awaiting him, that he's, he's anticipating what is to come. And, and we limit it to he's going to be reunited with his father. He's going to, to sit on the throne of glory once more. He's going back home. And that's part of it. But the joy awaiting him is the same joy that every groom knows who's awaited his bride as she arrives at the, at, at the place of marriage and starts walking towards him. He knows what's coming as, 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 as the groom is getting ready in the morning or whenever for his for his wedding there's a whole raft of emotions and what's what's drawing him and calling him and exciting him is the joy that awaits him his bride and what and what 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 the writer of Hebrews is saying is is that Jesus endured the cross Jesus drew strength from his bride isn't that an incredible thought? That you and I help strengthen the very one who gave his life for us. That you and I, when we live in a right relationship with God and with one another, we bring strength to our groom. This is, I think this, and, and doesn't that begin to change everything for us? You know, what do we do with this? What, what do we, how do we live out of this? Well, I, I, here's what I know about marriage. Every bride that I have ever, whose wedding I've ever officiated at, I know has spent a lot of time preparing herself. Everything about her life, uh, from the moment the ring goes on, is about the day uh, when she stands with her groom and to be pronounced husband and wife. Everything is about that. The shopping, all of the conversations, all of the, all, all of the magazines she reads and, and all of the dreams that she has. and Everything is about that one day. She prepares herself. She studies her, hu her husband-to-be. You know, what are his likes and dislikes? And she wants to be the best possible wife that she can be. And so she prepares herself. You know, I remember when um, Anne and I were recording and, and we decided we were going to get married. And at that time, I, I, was, I, I wasn't working in the church uh, and I used to wear these business shirts. And the thing that uh, I was very particular about was having single creases. I did not like railway tracks down my, down my shirts. Uh, they had to be perfectly pressed. And Anne knew this. And unbeknownst to me, because she wanted to, to be a good wife, to please me and to honour me, she practised ironing. Yeah, I know. That was 33 years ago. So, you know, don't, don't, don't just think, wow, really? That was 30, that's what we did back then because she wanted to be a good wife. And don't, don't think it was one way. It was two way. I knew that the person that, that Anne respected more than anyone else was her father. Uh, and so I observed him. I would have conversations with him. And I, I wanted to understand his personality, his character and everything else because I figured if she respects him, if I can pick up some things from him and incorporate those into my life, then she'll respect me as well. So, you know, that, that's, that's what we did to prepare for marriage back then. Begs the question, though, 
if brides prepare themselves for their groom, how are you and I to prepare ourselves for our groom? And Revelation 19, it talks about uh, the wedding between the church and, and Jesus, between the bride of Christ and our groom, Jesus. And in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6, 7 and 8, John gives us some helpful insights into how to prepare ourselves. He begins by saying he, he hears uh, what sounds like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. There's a sense in which uh, there's a, a growing expectancy and excitement because something significant is about to unfold. Let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's the marriage between the bride of Christ and Christ. That's you and I and Jesus. And get this, and his bride has prepared herself. So thought has gone in. Something has had to, to take place. What is it? How is it that you and I are to prepare ourselves for our, for our groom? She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the, white, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. Or as other versions put it, the righteous acts of God's holy people. You see, the wedding dress of the bride of Christ is comprised of the good deeds, the righteous acts of you and I now. Over the last 2,000 years and until Jesus returns, the people of God have been preparing a dress and to be woven out of the, the good deeds, the acts of righteousness that uh, have been done from one generation to the next. And of course, it begs the question, are we going to have enough material? Have we done enough to supply sufficient material for a dress fitting for the bride of Christ? You know, over the years, I've done, I've done a lot of weddings and I've never had a bride turn up in a bikini. Every bride that uh, I've had the, uh, the privilege of, of marrying has, has come uh, with the finest of dresses that they can. They have invested a lot of time and a lot of energy into preparing themselves and having a dress that, that turns heads. From the moment they get out of the car to the moment they, they stand at the front, heads are craning, looking to see what is she wearing. And you can hear the, the congregation go, oh, as, they, as they see her for the first time in all of her splendor, dressed in the finest that she can afford. And it's at the detail and everything is there just to, to draw people's attention and to make them recognize just how important this day is and for her and, and for her groom and, and just how much she values her husband to be no bride has ever turned up to weddings i've done dressed in a bikini dressed in a tank top and shorts they've gone all out and the bible says that that the dress that you and i are going to wear as the bride of christ on that day is going to be made up of the good deeds the acts of righteousness that you and i do today that's why the, Jesus, right at the very beginning, says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. Why? Because it's going to bring glory to your Father in heaven. You see, there used to be a tradition way back um, of this thing called glory boxes. Some of you may remember them where uh, you would take a box, a, a beautifully carved trunk or something like that. Nowadays, it's, it's probably just a, a cardboard box or a plastic cube sitting in the wardrobe or under your bed. And, and what you'd put in it was all of the things that you, were, you, you would save up ready for your marriage. And, and there's a sense in which what Jesus is saying, even before we've been formed into the bride, start doing good deeds now because you're going to need them one day. Your good deeds are going to bring glory to your Father in heaven. Your good deeds that you do now are going to reflect on your Father who's also the Father of the groom. You see, the Bible is very clear that you and I need to, to, to live out of our faith in very practical ways. And I know that many of us struggle with this because we, we, we grow up with this tension between, but I'm saved by grace. And, but what about acts of works? That's like the Pharisees. That's like law. And we have this sort of battle, don't we, between one or the other. 
And it's like, you know, but I'm just saved by grace. I don't need to do works. And, and others say, oh, I need works. And, and, and we argue about it. And yet here we see that actually you do need works. So what's the relationship? Well, in Titus chapter 2, uh, it's laid out very clearly for us. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. You and I need grace. And you and I only discover it. And we talked about this in the last series. Uh, it's all from God's initiative. He doesn't need to do it. He chooses to do it. Uh, we don't deserve it, but He gives it to us and brings us into salvation. And as a consequence, He gives His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us His own people. Why? So that we can become totally committed to doing good deeds. You see, when grace comes into our life, it should change our behavior and our attitude as a consequence of now being made sons and daughters of the Most High so that we set our minds to doing good deeds. And it's those good deeds that are going to form the dress that we wear when we stand before our groom in heaven. So one of the most significant ways that you and I can prepare is simply by going about doing good. By going on mission. By doing the things that talked about last week by bringing hope to bear by sowing joy by by being everything that God's called us to be in the lives of others of pointing them beyond what is to what could be to building bridges between despair and hope building bridges between dark and light of being carriers of grace and truth that's what it means to to, to do good works and it's, it's so important. I hope you begin to see that because it, it prepares us for what is to come. This is why Jesus says in, in Matthew, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And the, what is the will of the Father? To do good works because they bring glory to him. See, the reason Jesus says that not everyone who's, who, who, who receives my grace will actually enter into eternity because I've got grace that's enough for me. And Jesus says, no, grace changes you to be totally committed to doing good works. Without these, this here hasn't achieved its purpose in your life. This here is the grace is about bringing about God's purposes in your life, which is to change you. And, and when you're changed, you, you're totally committed to good deeds. And those good deeds end up being the very thing that we wear as we stand before our groom at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, our works of righteousness, our good deeds, they bring strength. They bring hope. They bring, um, they, 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 they actually reinforce, if you will, the work of the cross. They, they add strength to what Jesus did. They, they help what Jesus did. We can't add to what Jesus did, but we can strengthen it. We can help it. This is what Jesus says in John uh, 17. I've brought glory to, to you on earth. He's speaking to his father by finishing the work you gave me to do. What was the work that he gave them to do? To bring us to him. What's yours and my work? Well, we saw that in, in Matthew, um, to do good deeds. So our good deeds strengthen what Jesus did on the cross. They help what Jesus do, did on the cross. They don't add to it, but they strengthen it in the lives of other people. They strengthen the witness of what Jesus did. They help the, the, the testimony of the cross in other people's lives. And that's why we're called to do them. What are the, the acts of righteousness? What are the good works that you're not called to do? Well, we see them in, in Matthew 25. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. That's, that's a good work. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. That's a work. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. That's hospitality. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. These are the works of righteousness. These are the good uh, works, that, the good deeds that you and I are called to do. And as we do them, we are creating fabric in heaven to weave the most incredible dress fitting for the bride of Christ. 
You see, and Jesus goes on and speaks to the people who were doing all of these things. And the righteous, that's you and I, are going to answer him. But Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or, or needing clothes and, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you and get this? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whenever you did what, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see, we need to go on mission into other people's lives because the other people that we go on mission to are the brothers and sisters of Christ, which makes them your family and mine. And how do we do that? Just by doing good. Just simply by reaching out, doing good, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, uh, visiting the lonely, bringing hope to those in prison, doing the things that Jesus had called us to do. You see, what's happened in, in, in my experience is I think we've reduced the life of faith to praying a prayer and telling people about Jesus. Of simply saying, okay, Jesus, here I am. I was a sinner. I accept your work on the cross. Forgive me. Now, welcome me into your family. And then some of us go on and we tell people about Jesus. But you know what? When I think about this, when I think about the way Jesus said, just go around and do these good works and people go around doing them and then they get to heaven. And say, But when, when did we do these things? He said, when you did it to the least. I think this is what it tells me. People need to see Jesus before they can follow him. People need to see Jesus before they can follow him. People need to see our good works that they may glorify our Father in heaven. How does the Father get glory in heaven from our good works? By seeing Christ and then embracing him as their Saviour as well. By recognising what Jesus did on the cross and, and, and accepting it. That brings glory to the Father. But people won't follow Jesus until they see him. Which begs a question, doesn't it? What are people seeing in your life and mine? What do people see in our lives? How much of Jesus do they see in our lives? What are we doing to show people Jesus? Honesty time. How much fabric have we created? What are we going to be wear, wearing when we stand in heaven? You know, I think so many of us are are expectant and are excited, but we haven't made preparation. I want to say that it's time for us to make preparation. You see, I think that so many of us, and why this is so important for us to recognize we are the bride of Christ, as a bride invests herself in getting, getting ready to be married. And everything about her is about that. It keeps us focused on, on the works of, of righteousness, the good deeds that God has called us to, that usher in his kingdom, that bring people into a saving relationship with him. But the problem with the church is that so many of us live as though we're already married rather than engaged. Someone who's engaged, the focus is the wedding. Someone who's married, hey, I've arrived. You can tell the couples who've been married for a while because they sit down and they don't need to speak. They, they, they know what the other's thinking. They, 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 they read the paper, they read the book, they watch TV, they're scrolling through their social media, whatever, they're comfortable. And I think so many Christians live like that. They, they don't delight in opening up the word and, and getting to know their groom better. They don't busy themselves wondering about their, about their groom. You know, I remember when, when Anne and I were courting that it was before the days of mobile phones and, and she would go home from work uh, late at night after, after a shift at, at the hospital and she would leave me letters under my windscreen wiper for me to find in the morning. We would ring, I would send flowers, we, would, we, we wanted each other to know how important and how excited we were for one another and about our life that was in front of us. We were always thinking about the other and what could we do to bless, to strengthen, to help one another. And that's the, that's the way that you and I should be about our Saviour. And, and, and how, we do, how we do that is through the good works. We should be thinking, how can I bring honour and glory to my, to, you know, to, to my groom? I'll do some good works. I'm going to meet, I'm going to serve the people he came to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see in the person I walk past in Cuba Street, Jesus, and I'm going to stop and I'm going to give them something to eat. 
That person at the office, I, that, you know, I, I'm going to get alongside of Gary and I'm just, gonna, I'm just really going to go all out and just try and help them get over themselves or, or get past that veneer and, and just help them because I see Jesus in them. Because Jesus says when you do it for Gary, you're doing it for him. I think you and I need to learn to start living as though we're engaged and not married. We need to start weaving fabric. And we start doing that with good deeds. You see, who we are shapes what we do. Last, Sunday, last Saturday, a group of us here met and we were planning and talking and discussing our mission as a church, what we're going to do, what do we need to stop doing and everything else. Because we as a church are committed to living out of the fullness of being part of the bride of Christ, of doing good works to create a dress that is fitting for our Saviour. And I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to make a commitment to make the most of every opportunity that you get by yourself and that you get as part of ALC, to engage in and reaching out to our communities and beyond with the hope of the gospel. Doing good works, doing good deeds, doing acts of righteousness, not for our sake, but for our groom's sake, for the glory of our Father in heaven. That when our time comes to stand with our groom, everybody who's watching is going, ooing and ahhing as they see this incredible dress that we have woven by the things we do today. So I hope that encourages you. I hope that begins to change your view of what it means to be the bride of Christ and how we might start living out of that. Until next time, God bless you.